Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Michael Rust, currently still with uh, ESA. I will have the pleasure to join the International Space Science Institute as of January 2022. And I have the great privilege and pleasure to introduce our speaker of today's EC Game Changer seminar entitled Positive Tipping Points to Avoid Climate Tipping Points. I made the experience in 2008 when I fir first read a very important paper about tipping elements in the Earth climate system, which commonly referred to critical thresholds at which tiny perturbations can quantitatively alter the state of development of a system. But 13 years later, the same scientist who is presenting here today, um, Professor Tim Lanton from the University of Exeter, has gone a lot further and is trying to show us what kind of positive tipping points have to be triggered in order to avoid climate change tipping points. Tim Lenton, cordial welcome to you. Tim is the founding director of the Global Systems Institute um, at the University of Exeter. He's the chair in climate change and earth system science uh, at the University of Exeter. He is renowned for identifying many climate tipping points and one of the leading authors in that field. Um, he's also co-authored the book together with Andy Watson, Revolutions That Made the Earth, um, uh, a very short introduction on earth system science, which is also one of his works. And he co-authored Planetary Boundaries Framework, which won the Times Higher Education Award. He also got the Philip Leverhulme Prize in 2004 and the EGU Outstanding Young Science Award in 2006. There are many more prizes uh, that he won, scientific prizes, uh, which you find in, in Tim's uh, abstract in the announcement of ISI, but I do want to mention and stress um, that apart from being a highly uh, cited researcher, he is in the top 100 list of Reuters hot list of the world's top climate scientists. Tim, we are all very happy to welcome you here, and we are looking for, to, forward to an interesting talk that will enlighten us about uh, Earth Tipping's elements. Welcome to you, and over to you, Tim. Thank you, Michael, for the kind introduction. Great to be here virtually. One day we'll be back together in person, I'm sure. I'm just going to try and get the share screen working. We're nearly there. Sorry, I'm just having a bit of computer trouble today, so you've got to bear with me. I'm hoping this is going to work. It worked five minutes ago, everybody. Um, oh dear. <laughs> Never do a technical test. You do a technical test and it works, and then you do the real thing and it doesn't. Can you see that slide yes. okay now? We can okay, see okay, great. We get started. So yeah, positive tipping points to avoid climate tipping points is my topic today. At first, I want to show you a little toy model of a system that I'm forcing to and past a tipping point. So it's a system with two alternative states, but it's in the one on the left, the little ball rolling around in the valley. The ball's being nudged by some short term variability like the weather in the climate system, but the climate's also being changing slowly and and at that point, it just uh, got to a point where the original state of this system lost stability and it was uh, inevitably tipped abruptly and somewhat irreversibly into the other state. And that sort of toy model, well, that's a reasonable toy model for tipping points in a whole range of complex systems, including parts of the climate, but also aspects of social systems. So in the next slide, I'm just summarizing from the literature a whole range of different systems on different space and time scales for which we know they can exhibit these tipping point dynamics. So in yellow, we've got bits of the climate system and some major events in Earth history. And then in blue, green and grey, we've got different types of ecosystem with known tipping points or regime shifts. And then in red, we've got some examples of kind of social tipping points, good or bad, if you like. And in the talk, I'm going to start on the climate tipping points for the first half, but then move to what I'm calling positive social tipping points in the second half. So yeah, climate tipping points. I want to give you 
an update on the science there to begin with and touch on the idea of uh, could we develop using remote sensing data a kind of resilient sensing system for the biosphere and for tipping points and then i'm going to shift gear and talk about um, what do we know about the positive tipping points that we need to find and trigger to, to uh, try and avoid the climate tipping points so yeah mike mike kindly mentioned the the original study of I led with a bunch of friends and colleagues, mostly from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, especially John Schaunhuber back in 2008. This is what we put on our map of potential tipping elements in the climate system back then. Tipping elements being the word we kind of crafted for large scale parts of the climate system, at least subcontinental in scale, for which we had evidence that they could be pushed past the tipping point by human activities. And one of them already had been on this map, the Antarctic ozone hole. The others were prospective things that might happen in the coming century. Um, we had several criteria for putting things on the map. One was whether we saw evidence that these bits of the climate system had been tipped between states in the past. The other source of evidence would be, did model projections show that they might be tipped in the future? And the third source of evidence, I suppose, was what do we understand about the underlying feedbacks within these systems? Because to get the tipping point to happen, it's when positive feedbacks within the dynamics of a system get so strong that they become self-propelling and they completely take over from what previously were the negative feedbacks that were maintaining those valleys or islands of stability. Nowadays, I would say, well, remote sensing has given us additional evidence of uh, that, that's helping us put put some other tipping elements on the map, which we'll come to. But since 2008, we learned quite a lot more about um, abrupt change and possible tipping points in the climate system. Firstly, this slide just summarizes how, when you look in the fifth assessment report of the IPCC and the models that are beneath it, the what's called the CMIP5 model data archive, and you look at well, do a, where or when do abrupt shifts happen in these model runs? You find that you quite a lot happen in different bits of the world, sort of dotted on the map there in different models. And in terms of temperature change above pre-industrial, interestingly, there's a whole lot of abrupt shifts in the models above about one degree of global warming and even more in the one and a half to two degrees range recalling that we're at about 1.1 degrees of warming at the moment. So if we believed our own models, we'd be thinking we were in the danger zone for, for, for abrupt climate change already. And in fact, the models start to show up some things that we hadn't spotted in the map in 2008. So there's a bunch of stuff clustered up in the Labrador Sea region here, telling us that several models show abrupt shift where Labrador Sea deep convection in the ocean collapses and then this triggers the climate change that's kind of implicated in the Little Ice Age historically in Europe and would, would create a Little Ice Age type climate change again if it happened in the future. So that's, you know, models can be one source of uh, scientific evidence, if you like, about possible tipping points and tipping elements, but observations in the last decade or so have become key to our developing understanding of these risks. So this is just a map where I tried to summarize some of the evidence, Most, much of it come from spaceborne remote sensing, but a lot of the evidence here summarized for change that's going in the wrong direction and often at an accelerating rate in previously identified tipping elements. So I won't go through all of them, but uh, we see alarming accelerating shrinkage of the Greenland ice sheet, for example, but even more, uh, alarming is the evidence from West Antarctica that part of the ice sheet there is possibly already past the tipping point for a kind of irreversible retreat of what's called the grounding line where the ice sheet separates from the bedrock below sea level. There's a couple of major glaciers draining into the Amundsen Sea embayment that are getting very close to uh, a sort of tipping point of glacier retreat where it becomes, the physics of it becomes self-propelling. It's it's to do with how the, the slope of the bedrock um, goes deeper and deeper further into the ice sheet past a certain point. 
Also in East Antarctica, there are parts of that massive ice sheet like the Wilkes Basin that, that are grounded below sea level and show seem to be showing worryingly similar dynamics. And when you top all this up, you have like, well, about eventually you get seven meters of sea level rise from melting the Greenland ice sheet. And eventually you get about three and a half meters from West Antarctica and possibly another three or four meters from the Wilkes Basin in East Antarctica. So we could have already committed to 10 meters of sea level rise or more for some future generations. The only saving grace is that that is the ice is melting relatively slowly at the moment, and we'd be talking many centuries in the future by to get that full sea level rise. But of course, the faster we warm things up, the faster the ice melts. Yeah, I won't go around all the map, but I'm going to come back to talk about evidence of change in, for example, the Amazon rainforest. And, may, and maybe in the Arctic sea ice as well. Uh, but you could, the summary here is that basically the new scientific evidence of the last decade or so has fed into this changing risk assessment of tipping points as seen by the IPCC in the successive assessment reports and special reports. In, in a nutshell, 20 years ago, when, when the IPCC first started considering the risk of abrupt climate change, the thinking was it would take at least four or five degrees of global warming before, before it became a significant likelihood of abrupt climate change events. Um, now, uh, in two recent special reports on the 1.5 degrees C target and on the oceans and the cryosphere in 2018 and 2019, the consensus becomes that we're risking climate tipping points already at the present level of global warming. And we're definitely in the danger zone at one and a half degrees of warming. And things look pretty bleak, actually, at two degrees C of warming. If we go there, we should expect these to become like high impact, high likelihood events. Uh, I'm going back to my little toy model, though, to show that there's extra ways we can get warming, warning of the likelihood of tipping points. So what we're seeing at the bottom is how the, how's the ball fluctuating and moving around? And does that tell us something that, about how a tipping point is approaching? Basically, the ball rolls around slower as the valley gets shallower before the tipping point happens. That is because the negative feedbacks that maintain stability are getting weaker. So the restoring force on the ball is getting weaker. It rolls back slower in a shallower valley. Um, that means the whole system actually slows down in its response to perturbations. This has a formal mathematical name, it's called critical slowing down, and, it, and there are good statistical indicators to pick up that behaviour, and I show one of them in red at the bottom, and it's called lag one, autocorrelation in time, but it's just, you know, how similar is one data point in time to the next one, that self-similarity in time goes up as the system slows down, and you see it as these more persistent fluctuations in the behaviour. Now, for a decade or so, Several groups of us have been showing that this early warning signal existed before past abrupt climate changes, at least in some cases, and it exists in some climate models that we can deliberately force past tipping points. But just in the last year or so, the several studies start to summarize analysis of real data, basically mostly remotely sensed data from different tipping elements, and show consistent early warning signals in the form of this rising lag one autocorrelation, AR1 we call it, and rising variance for the retreat of the Arctic summer sea ice extent there, for the height, if you like, of the central western part of the Greenland ice sheet, which is undergoing a precipitous decline, and also for fluctuations in the strength of the Atlantic Ocean's great meridional overturning circulation. So that one's a little bit more complicated, but that there's a basically a, a sea surface temperature fingerprint, as it's called, that reflects the underlying strength of that circulation. Uh, that's weakening, but also the fluctuations are slowing down. That's why the variance is going up and the autocorrelation is going up. And these are very statistically robust signals of basically showing these are systems heading towards tipping points. What it's not telling us is quite how close the tipping point is, but it's a clear warning signal. And it motivated it, some of this work has been motivating my group to start thinking about could we generalize this approach and just say, well, 
by looking at something like um, autocorrelation in time, AR1, we're looking at a measure of what we would call the resilience of, of, of a system. And we might choose to do that, for example, for vegetation across the planet. So what I'm showing you here is, what is the mean value of um, temporal autocorrelation of net NDVI, the famous vegetation greenness index, um, aggregated to what are called eco-regions, so distinctive sort of eco-regions, 800 or so of which across the planet here. Um, and, when, and this is just the average value from the MODIS NDVI data over the last 20 years. What it shows us is places in the darker red, we uh, higher AR1 we'd interpret as less resilient, slower fluctuations of the vegetation greenness. Places in the whiter or paler red would be more resilient, lower AR1. What do you see? Well, there's some clear patterns there. They make some sense. You see that hot and dry places like Australia and Southern Africa look the least resilient. They have the highest AR1, the slowest fluctuations of the MDVI. Wet, humid, hot, tropical places like the Amazon rainforest look to be the most resilient um, on the mean state and the Congo there and Southeast Asian rainforests. But also, if you look a bit harder, you see, aha, also cold, sort of dry places like the tundra are also apparently more resilient, or at least vegetation greenness fluctuations are slower there um, than they are in these um, arid, arid places like Southern Africa, or Australia, or somewhere in the middle of the Andes, or Mexico, for example. So uh, we just became curious to look a little bit more detail at these patterns of resilience of different ecosystems. And this is how that resilience measure where higher AR1 is lower resilience and lower AR1 is higher resilience. How does that depend on precipitation here for the 800 odd eco regions that we just looked at on the map? Clear relationship. Clearly the resilience drops off as it were, once you get below about two and a half meters of annual rainfall. Um, there are some interesting anomalies though, because I've colored the points here, here in by biome type. And so the tundra, it's dry, but it's cold and it, it's actually quite resilient by this metric. Obviously one would have some doubts, I think about plotting what are on here as deserts and uh, shrublands, some of these sort of murky green points. But the rest I think shows a clear signal. And there's also a temperature effect. So here I'm plotting this this inverse of resilience, if you like, AR1 as a color, uh, lower resilience, yellow color, high resilience, blue color, as a function of now temperature on the x-axis and rainfall on the y-axis. So we have the same pattern that as the rainfall goes down, uh, the resilience tends to go down and the AR1 goes up. But if we just look at a given level of rainfall in the dry settings, we can see a clear temperature effect that if it's dry but cold, it's still resilient. But if it's dry and hot, of course, it's the least resilient, the yellow points over here. So having looked at the mean kind of resilience of different ecoregions across the planet, it's natural to ask the question, are there any trends in resilience just within the 20 year sampling interval? So this is, um, this is red for a declining resilience or rising AR1 and blue for increasing resilience, um, declining AR1. So there's lots of caveats here. It's only a 20 year sample. We're using a moving window of 10 years on the data here, uh, worked by my PhD student, Josh Buxton. Um, so we probably want more data, you know, wait longer and get more data to see if robust trends continue. But it's interesting to note that where we know that the climate's been wetting, like in East Africa, there seems to be a gain, gain in resilience of the vegetation greenness. Whereas there's some signs that across chunks of the Amazon, there's a possible there's a clear sign of loss of resilience. And then there's other places where you start to get a coherent loss of resilience, including in the Congo, interestingly. So I don't want to dwell on that too much. We just um, looked at this map this morning, in fact. But we have been doing further work looking specifically at the Amazon. And one wants to ask the question, well, which remotely sensed metric is the right thing to look at if you want to understand the resilience of, say, the Amazon rainforest? 
And for a rainforest and for trees, I don't think greenness, NDVI, is the best metric. We looked at it carefully and decided that no, instead, vegetation optical depth, which is a proxy, if you like, for the water content of the forest, which is in turn influenced by the biomass of the forest. We found that that was a much better indicator of what we could deduce from on the ground measurements, et cetera, of uh, changes in biomass and tree cover. So what we chose to do in another study that's still in review is we analyzed what's the trend in this or AR1, leg one autocorrelation of vegetation optical depth across the Amazon pixel, sort of by pixel there, aggregated pixels. And where it's red, it means that the forest is losing resilience. And where it's blue, it's gaining resilience. And where it's gray, it's sort of no trend. And this is now slightly different interval from the data goes from about 1991 to 2016, and we use a five-year sliding window. And basically what we find, this pronounced loss of resilience over most of the forest, uh, particularly since, since the early 2000s, basically. Um, so for nearly, for around 15, 20 years. Um, we've done further work to look at has that got, what's that got to do with um, human land use or, or climate? Uh, ask me about that in the questions if you're curious. But just to show you that what you can what you can now mine out of remotely sensed data to get a sense of, in this case, loss of resilience or stability of a major tipping element in the climate system. And right now I'm in the middle of trying to update the map of the tipping elements informed by all of this sort of work. So we're now subdividing them into the, what I'm calling the global core climate tipping elements, the ones that if you kind of tip them, it affects the whole operation of the whole climate system. And maybe it feeds back global temperature in some cases quite significantly. So lots of things that are on the individual map, but also this Labrador Sea convection has got onto this map, as has some of the East Antarctic ice sheet and East Antarctic subglacial basins. Then we have another map for what I'm calling regional impact climate tipping elements, where we're not sure if you lost them, it would have a profound, whether it would have a global impact on the climate system, uh, or whether the feedback on the temperature to, in, is strong enough, but they're still really, really important for um, people and for biodiversity and so on. So you see some of the things that get onto this map, like the, the projected abrupt loss of low latitude coral reefs and collapse of the West African monsoon, for example. Um, and of course, what we also want to do is summarize what do we know about the tipping point temperature thresholds for all of these systems. So that's what this plot is about. This is a summary from the, all the evidence we can mine out of the literature, often from model studies for what do we know about where the temperature tipping point is for different systems lined up along the bottom, um, all the ones that were just on the last two maps. And we use this burning embers color scale, but our dotted line, the sort of dots in the middle here is the best guess temperature tipping point. Where it starts to go into the yellow is the lowest estimate, say from one model of a tipping point, and dark red is sort of going up to the highest estimate at the top of the color bar from some model. So you see that at the current level of warming, well, we're already sort of, depends which model you believe, but we could, we're in the sort of risk zone for tipping the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets, the low latitude coral reefs, parts of the boreal permafrost. If we go up to one and a half degrees of warming, which is our best, the best we can hope for in the future, well, that puts those systems at greater risk and it brings some other systems at risk of tipping points. But if we go to two degrees, it just gets worse and so on and so on. Um, this stuff on the right is just information about where our current policy targets would be taking us. So yeah, that, that was just assuming that the tipping points didn't interact, they didn't causally interact. But of course, I've also been trying to alert people to the evidence that there are causal interactions between the tipping elements. So for example, but because we're losing the Arctic sea ice at an accelerating rate, and that's causing amplified warming in the Arctic, that's contributing to the Greenland the ice sheet melt, as well as the fires in the boreal forest, the thawing of the permafrost, the meltwater pouring off Greenland and the extra rainfall in the Arctic coming into the North Atlantic Ocean is, they're contributing to, to weakening this Atlantic overturning circulation, 
Earth's history tells us that when you weaken that, you disrupt rainfall all around the tropics, monsoons in South America, West Africa, India. You also leave heat behind in the Southern Ocean, which is a, a risk or a threat to the, to the ice sheets there in West Antarctica and parts of East Antarctica. So uh, it's not always like that, but basically in summary, the interactions between the tipping elements is gonna, if it's gonna do anything, it's gonna make the, bring the temperature thresholds lower. It's gonna mean if we start tipping one thing, it makes tipping others more likely. So all of those are very good reasons to want to go down the red line in this plot, which is to say lots of reasons why we should do our level best as societies to try and limit global warming to one and a half degrees C. And to have a sort of 50% chance of doing that, we need to go from this green line of rising global greenhouse emissions down this precipitous slope of red, the red line to shut down all global greenhouse gas emissions within a generation by the middle of the century, and then be able after that to, to draw to a net removal of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. A spectacular challenge. Um, this requires halving global greenhouse gas emissions within this decade by 2030, and then getting rid of them altogether by 2050. That's a rate of change that exceeds uh, well what we what we're seeing. I mean, in the lockdowns of 2020 with the COVID crisis, we now think the global emissions dropped about five percent, and they've bounced back unfortunately to 2019 levels this year, when instead they needed to be going down at seven percent year on year throughout the 2020s. So in, in simple terms, we've got to we've got to rapidly accelerate action and progress. In fact. Our calculation suggests we have to accelerate the decarbonisation of the economy by at least a factor of five. And that's why I want to switch over to talking about positive tipping points. So what basically, what tipping points can we find and trigger to accelerate the transformation from kind of business as usual state of the economy to decarbonised state? And this is all about uh, identifying the positive reinforcing feedbacks that can propel social, economic and technological change and get really strong and become self-propelling. Now, we've seen some encouraging examples of these positive feedbacks in action recently. So here's one for social change, because Greta Thunberg, by protesting in front of the Swedish parliament and skipping school on a Friday, makes it incrementally easier for the next person to join her process and skip school, who makes it sort of incrementally easier for the next person to join and so on. And within months, there were hundreds of thousands of people joining that particular social movement and marching on the streets, demanding more decisive political action on climate change. So that whole social dynamic is a classic example, a well understood actually example of, of tipping point dynamics in society. And it did lead to changes in um, political uh, Re uh, de declarations, shall we say. So this is the European Parliament voting to declare a climate emergency in November 2019, just after the day after one of the papers I showed you was published. But it, uh, political declarations aren't, aren't going to aren't going to solve the problem. Only action f following from those declarations, decisive action, is going to solve the problem. So that's what I want to talk about next. Do we have any evidence that there could be a really abrupt changes in the relevant parts of society and technology and corresponding uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Well, the, the good news is society has changed abruptly and, it, and it's changed its relationship with technology abruptly in the past. It doesn't always happen, but here's one famous example. So this is going to be a photograph of Easter Parade, Fifth Avenue, New York City in the year 1900. Uh, everyone's in a horse-drawn carriage and your task is to spot the one person in an automobile in the photograph. They're over there, it's sort of in the middle of the shot. But 13 years later, it's the same Easter parade on Fifth Avenue, New York City in the year 1913. And you have the opposite challenge. You have to spot the one person left in a horse-drawn carriage when everybody else is in an automobile. Interestingly, they're on the same side of the street in the same sort of bit of the shot. They're just over there. Now, that, that's a very abrupt transition in personal transport that happened in a decade across, across US cities and continued to spread, of course, around the world. 
um, we probably look upon it uh, with regret now in a sense. But in the middle of the transition, interestingly, there was a point at which 30% of the early cars were battery electric vehicles. Um, of course, it they, that's not how it turned out. Apparently, Thomas Edison talked Henry Ford out of battery electric technology and into the internal combustion engine. Then we had the Model T and the rest is kind of history. But this is uh, only one example of how abrupt technology change has happened repeatedly in the past. So now I'm plotting lots of what are called S-curves of the uptake of new technologies over the last century or so, where the data is good for the US. And the key point here is there are some really well-known reinforcing feedbacks that always underlie this kind of abrupt social technological change. So the more we make something, the better that we, we get at making it. We call that in English, learning by doing. You tell me what it's called in Swiss. Um, then we have the more something is made, the more cheaply it can be made. So we call that economies of scale in English. And then also, I'm, I'm not sure what to call this, but the more some new technology gets used, the more technologies are made to make it more useful. I think we're going to call that technological reinforcement. But that would apply, for example, to electric vehicles and charging networks as complementary technologies. So those are, those are well-known feedbacks uh, in the diffusion of technology. There's also a thing called social contagion in academic language, which is where we have a habit of copying what our neighbours or our friends are doing. And that could be changing norms, it could be changing behaviours, or it could be adopting new technologies. And there's evidence that this social contagion is happening for the uptake of some sustainable technologies like uh, pictured here, solar panels on roofs. And here's a little movie. It's gonna spool around three years. It's a part of Colorado in the US and you're just watching um, solar panel customers, uh, first time customers in yellow and then referrals in green. And you can kind of see the social contagion of solar panels on people's, people's houses happening in front of your eyes. But uh, the example I want to turn to in a bit more detail that where there's a bit of social contagion going on, but there's a lot else interesting going on, is a recent tipping point for uptake of electric vehicles that started in Norway. And it's, uh, it started back in the late 1980s, interestingly, with these famous characters. This is the pop band Aha, with a chap, Frederic, here. I think might be Swiss by birth, actually. You tell me, folks. But he had, Frederick had converted this Fiat Panda in the background into a battery electric vehicle, stated range about 45 kilometers. Aha bought the car and together they imported it into Norway. But uh, they managed to persuade the Norwegian government to waive the registration import tax, which is quite hefty for all vehicles in Norway. So that created an immediate incentive to have an electric vehicle. And then over the coming decade, uh, AHA proceeded to argue that they shouldn't have to pay road tolls for an electric vehicle because it was a clean car. So they would uh, refuse to pay the road tolls, they would get the car confiscated, and then they would eventually buy it back at auction um, for less than the fine they would have had to pay. And then they would repeat this, and this went over and over, and eventually the government decided to waive road tolls for electric cars in Norway. And then the government caught wind of this and started um, deliberately incentivizing further electric vehicle ownership by doing things like letting the electric vehicles access the bus lanes in Oslo, um, which meant that people could get to school or to work in half the time if they had an electric car. One thing led to another. Now you go to the streets of Oslo, you see it looks like this. You see that electric cars are kind of dominant. And to show you that in real data, this is, uh, this is the market share of electric vehicles in the bright blue color over time, plug-in hybrids, non-plug-in hybrids, petrol, diesel. You see it's just in the last 10 years that electric cars have gone from a tiny part of the market to the dominant um, part, part of the car market in Norway. And we had a look at this data in a different way. We're plotting here how does the electric vehicle market share in different countries across Europe depend on the difference in price between an electric car and an internal combustion engine vehicle. So what we did is we just averaged the price of an equivalent petrol or diesel car. And when the cost difference here is minus, it means the petrol or diesel car is cheaper. When it's zero, it means they're the same price to buy if you go to the dealership or buy 
And in Norway, yeah, that when they're the same price, thanks to some clever policy incentives, um, for sure, people are buying electric cars. This is the 29 data, 2019 data, sorry, and it's a bit out of date. The, you know, Norway would be further up the chart right now. You see, though, that there's a really strong tipping point non-linearity. Everywhere else, it's only 5% market share until you get really close to price, price parity, and then bang, people switch technology. So that's perhaps interesting in and of itself. It tells us something about how one can incentivize a tipping point to electrifying transport. But there's good news here that the more that happens, uh, the more it will become self-propelling. So what I'm plotting is how battery price, which is the key thing that adds to the price of the electric car, how that's coming down over time, the more batteries that get made and the more electric cars that get sold. So it's an amazing economy of scale, basically, for batteries. And that gives a clue as to how one, well, policymakers at least, could be part of triggering deliberate tipping point to electrifying transport. It's clear from the Norway example how they can put in policies that will incentivize this. But the point is, once those, once this starts to become effective and the market starts to grow, the whole thing becomes self-propelling because of the economies of scale. Basically, the battery prices come down. We get within a few years to the point where in many major economies, uh, electric vehicles will be cheaper to make than petrol or diesel cars, at which time they'll definitely be te cheaper to buy, and I think everyone will be buying them. So that's a kind of tipping point that becomes self-propelling. But what's interesting about it is it could open up opportunities for other tipping points. So obviously, if you have loads of cheap batteries available in the economy, it opens up the opportunities to electrify light goods transport. It might stop oil firms from hedging and might persuade them to reinvent themselves, not as oil firms, but as something else. But most interestingly for me, if you have a load of cheap battery storage available because of this sort of electrification of transport revolution, that's gonna really help enable the, the transition to renewable energy because the one problem that has to be solved with renewable energy uh, and that needs cheap power storage is, is that when you want to like boil the kettle, it's not necessarily when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. So cheap batteries is one kind of cheap storage that can uh, iron out that problem in a renewable energy future. So yeah, I want to turn to talk about a final example of a tipping point um, away from coal burning and certainly towards renewable power that's been that's been happening in my home country, the UK. So it's a bit of a complicated chart to start with, but basically the story is that um, we've been investing in a big way, the, the British taxpayer, in um, renewable energy capacity in the UK, much of it offshore wind, but also biomass, energy, and solar. And then on what what that means is um, when you're trying, if you're what's called the national grid in the UK, who, who, who supply electricity to all of us, um, basically you're going to take all the renewable capacity you're going to, you can get on the national grid. Uh, but then if it uh, normally you go next to the cheapest fossil fuel, which would normally be coal, but coal is the dirtiest fossil fuel for emissions. So if you put a price on carbon emissions um, in power generation, you can tip the dynamics. So instead of going to coal, you go to natural gas next, which has half the emissions for the same power generation. And this is basically the story of what's happening in this plot. There's a price on carbon emissions from power generation from the EU in grey, but the um, British government chose to um, put an additional price on carbon emissions just in the power sector and then step it up twice. So that's the blue shaded area. And sometime in late 2015, this basically uh, tipped the dynamics so gas became cheaper than coal and suddenly went up in use on the grid. That could have been a reversible change because these red line wiggles around a lot. The market's pretty volatile. The price of fuels is changing all the time. But it had some interesting effects. As this analyst says in this quote from 2016, um, the people who were invested in coal realised they weren't making any money. And the economics, economics of coal burning basically went bad in the UK. And the money pulled out, the investors pulled out, and then the utility companies that run the power stations started doing this. They started destroying coal power stations. They're actually still destroying them in the UK, but this one was uh, one in Oxfordshire being destroyed at Didcot. 
Now that's an irreversible tipping point. No one's, no one's now going to go back to coal power in the UK. And this is the end result. The black line is the contribution of coal to power generation in the UK. In 2012, at the peak there, it's 40% of electricity supply in the UK. I haven't carried on through to 2021, but I can tell you it's less than 2% um, at present. And here's the renewables picking up most of the slack, the green, and blue, and the yellow. Now, we should be thinking also about how to go global with the renewable energy tipping point. But uh, the good news is that's coming anyway because of these economies of scale. So this is how the price of solar photovoltaic panels declines the more solar voltaic panels you make on the x-axis, both on a log scale, the price and the, and the deployment. And things were sort of stalling up to 2008, but then you see this spectacular fall in price since then, as the market has just expanded exponentially. Interestingly, it was private finance. It was a floating of five solar PV companies on the stock on the US stock exchange around 2007-8, that pouring in of money that basically kick-started this incredible cost curve, as it's called. And it means most some of the analysts are saying that within a decade, in many parts of the world, solar will be generating power at, at like a fifth of the price of any fossil fuel. There's a similar cost curve, curve for wind power. Um, and this means the renewable energy revolution is coming, like it or not, as it were. <laughs> And, and the only thing that's keeping the fossil fuels going at the moment, I'm afraid, is a lot of um, perverse subsidies and tax credits in their favour in most of the world. Because this map shows you how in the first half of 2020, if you take out those subsidies and tax credits, the cheapest form of power generation is usually either wind in blue or solar in yellow or gold. Of course, there's a bit of subtlety here. You also should factor in what's the price of storage for the renewables. Um, but that, as we've seen, is coming down rapidly as well. So what's really interesting is these tipping points towards renewable, clean electricity and electrifying transport, they kind of feed back off each other through the cheap, ever cheaper batteries. And the fact that, of course, ever cheaper and cleaner renewable energy um, boosts and supports the electrification of transport. And then maybe those changes start to cascade through the economy because you have you get to a point where you're, you know, in this UK case, the wind's blowing so hard, maybe at night when there isn't much electricity demand, that you have excess uh, clean electricity, you start making hydrogen with that, and off you go, that helps you decarbonize the rest of the economy. Well, that was very technology centered, and I should finish up. But I just want to say a few words about how, when you start thinking about this for ecology, you got all uh, extra dimension, which is that ecosystems are full of their own feedbacks that and cascades that can tip change in a bad or a good direction. And there are like icon iconic examples of that, like uh, taking grey wolves out of Yellowstone National Park and putting them back, in each case, radically change the whole ecosystem. But some researchers are starting to work with these dynamics. So here's a blue mussel bed, an edible mussel bed with its own Sp beautiful spatial patterns and self-organized complexity. Well, some Dutch researchers have already worked out that they can sort of work with the feedbacks that are intrinsic to the muscle bed and the muscles and just do simple technology, like put some fences down to stabilize the mud and you can start um, recovering and, and growing these, what in this case is a, is a sustainable food source of protein from the ocean. So yeah, that's led me and some colleagues to think about what are the possible positive tipping points for transforming food and land systems that, that we might uh, think about triggering. And I won't dwell on that, but we have written this report where we look at three, three case studies in a bit more detail, one of which is a possible tipping point for dietary change and alternative protein sources focused on Europe. So that can be plant-based meat substitutes, it can be lab-cultured meats, it can be people choosing to turn away from red meat in their diet. Um, we think that's, a, that's an opportunity, shall we say, for a positive tipping point that would have huge climate benefits. It would also have huge ecological benefits and considerable health benefits. And yeah, I'm at the point where now I'm trying to, I've just got a paper accepted out articulating a sort of recipe or framework for how do we, how do we identify 
and trigger positive tipping points. So who are the who are the agents of change or the coalitions of society, finance, policy, media, scientists that could come together to make the tipping happen uh, sooner and faster? But I'll, I'll, I'll finish there and summarize. So I started off sort of making you depressed and telling you in simple terms, we're in a climate emergency and we might have already passed some damaging climate tipping points and we're definitely heading towards others. So we need to limit global warming to well below two degrees C, but we've left it so late now that we need to find some other positive tipping points in society to have any hope of meeting that target. I've tried to show you that there's some evidence that those tipping points are already starting to happen and that you know we could get we can all be part of that positive tipping but also earlier on in the talk i tried to touch on the idea that bringing it back to you know space and remote sensing i think we're at a point where we've got the opportunity to develop what i'm calling a resilient sensing system that could kind of help provide early warning of the bad biosphere tipping points but if we also started to apply it to social systems we might even start to get some clues to where we could intervene to trigger the positive tipping points. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for the most interesting, but uh, to a certain extent also alerting talk. Uh, the resilience system at the very end is a, is, a, is a very, very interesting point you raised there. I forgot to mention in the beginning that um, Tim was leading one of the ISI uh, forums on tipping elements earlier this year. And there is a, a major publication uh, in the making, which we're all looking forward to. So thanks again uh, very much for this very illustrative and interesting, but also critical talk. I would encourage um, the colleagues uh, on the seminar, on the call, in case of questions to either put them in the chat, which I help um, uh, look, look a little bit uh, over for, for Tim, or uh, to raise a hand. Um, Tim, we already have uh, two questions. Uh, William Wall, uh, he also raised a hand, says, electric cars are more expensive to buy than petrol cars, but electric cars are cheaper to own because of much less need for maintenance. That will also drive more sales of electric cars, which is actually making your feedback point, Tim. It's more a comment than a question by uh, by a good, Will, but uh, a, perhaps you want to comment on it. It's a good point, yeah. And I was we Simon Sharp and I who did who were looking at that uh, tipping point in terms of purchase price were actually a little bit surprised that it was a pure purchase price control for exactly the point you make, <laughs> Will, which is. Uh, if we were rational consumers, we would have worked out that uh, that inevitably the electric car is cheaper to run. So we should be willing to pay a little bit more to buy it in the first place. And yet we don't seem to be quite that smart, according to the data. It's still uh, purchase price parity that that tip the dynamics. But yet you're dead right. It should once we, once it becomes widely obvious that they are indeed cheaper to run. That should only serve to reinforce the transition. Good. Yeah, uh, uh, Baluwala is worried about promoting alternative renewable solution when it's pretty clear, according uh, to Balu, yeah, uh, yeah. they come with their own set of problems, i.e. electric cars. Won't we just switch one set of problems with another one? Um, well, we never without challenges in a society, especially when there are 7.6 billion of us heading for 9 billion. So at some point, in some sense, you, you can't avoid altering the environment but you've got to decide which is the lesser of uh, what what's the less less impactful option now i'm i am well aware of the problems particularly at the moment with the electric vehicles and sourcing cobalt for the batteries quite a lot of that's coming from the democratic republic of congo quite a lot of it's coming from itinerant miners who don't have great lives or working conditions so um, there are some issues there for sure and the different kind of mobility tipping point that I'm equally interested in is why don't we just travel less? And, and frankly, do we really need to own a car um, as we could just, you know, uh, future generations, I think, will just be calling an autonomously driven electric vehicle on their phone. <laughs> so we're also seeing shifts in patterns of working. So we travel less and work from home more. We're seeing electrification of scooters, bikes and the like. They have some impact issues as well. But I think generally I say we might have a more positive mobility tipping point 
As for the renewable energy revolution, though, I'm going to argue passionately that um, the impacts of renewable energy are so tiny compared to the, the de profoundly damaging impacts of fossil fuels that we need to embrace that renewable energy revolution as fast as possible. And to be frank, it's going to be completely liberating if we can get uh, that renewable energy revolution into sub-Saharan Africa, which is the one part of the world where still only a modest fraction of the population has any access to electricity. So I think it'll be a great democratizer and it'll bring power to some of the poorest people in the world in a literal and a metaphorical sense. In the context of renewable energy, we, I want to combine two points by Francisco Diego and by Alison about carbon-free nuclear power, as it requires enormous amounts of uh, CO2 when for the concrete and during construction, but also later during storage and reprocessing of waste. Now, Francisco and Alison are running in open doors, but any comment from your side, Tim, on um, nuclear power because we often forget uh, all the we, yeah well i mean here in the uk we exchange electricity with france so it sometimes goes one way net and it sometimes goes the other way net but we're perhaps we're quite glad that france has got a predominantly nuclear power generation and we've got a great big cable <laughs> under the channel to each other but the general story with nuclear power is we could have had a present in a future with more of it, and it could be much smaller scale pebble bed reactors, thorium based, so it's not coupled to generating um, weapons grade fissionable material and all of this. But we, we're, we're highly unlikely to go there given the trajectory we've been on as societies, where my personal view is we have a disproportionate, completely disproportionate sense of the risks from nuclear power. We've completely misunderstood them. So yeah, I won't dwell on that point. The, the salient point is we've got to a point where nuclear is, at least in the UK, a pretty expensive option, possibly way more expensive now than yeah. the renewable offshore wind option is becoming. So it's simply, we may, you know, we may have a bit more of it as back, so-called backstop electricity supply. Um, and it would be preferable, in my view, to coal or natural gas. That's just my view, but the economics are such that it's not going to be a massive part of the mix unless something really radical happens. Instead, all the all the work is going on into smart grids and but and cheap storage so that you can get a, a workable renewables dominated grid. And lots of people said oh, it couldn't happen, it wouldn't work, blah, blah, blah. But actually, through experience and good engineering, we're rapidly learning that we can go to much more renewable energy penetration and electricity supply than anybody thought. Yeah. So I, I think yeah. I, have, I have an slide. interesting question by Keith Horn, who says, can or do people use the same techniques to <laughs> society in the wrong directions? Yeah, exactly the thing I worry about, Keith, is do ne will nefarious interests spot the potential of this? these dynamics and use them for nefarious ends or their own ends. And I, I think, well, I'm not sure I have a clear case study of that, but it's a definite moral concern, let's put it that way. And without going to the really bleak examples, what is clear, at least in the UK, is that we currently have strong vested interests, for example, in a transition to hydrogen power, the natural gas industry has a strong interest in the transition to hydrogen power instead of electric, and are pushing that agenda extremely hard in the social and political and finance space. But it's not clear whether, say, hydrogen for heating of homes in the UK is the logical option. The life cycle analysis would suggest that instead heat pumps on our homes with renewable electricity is the, by far the more sensible thing to do. So whilst it's not a bad outcome to have a hydrogen economy, we could get tipped into a suboptimal state just because strong vested interests of uh, are trying to trying to push that tipping. So we all need to perhaps switch on to this kind of thinking. Yeah. Um, Valentin Simeonov uh, put, made the point that wind and solar energy are not so green if you take into account the need of steel and cement. I think 
this goes a little bit in the direction of the answer that you gave earlier, or that the comment you made earlier on the on the nuclear power plant. So I would jump on the next one, which is nice. Uh, Balu again asks, uh, shouldn't scientists be part of the movements on the streets apart from giving talks and writing papers, given that the situation is so bad? And this would not be an attack on scientists, but rather a genuine question. Some of us are, Balu. So not all of us, but some of us are. Um, it's uh, everyone can make their own choice on this, but but I got quite a few colleagues who are part of the movement on the streets and proud of it. So yeah, come and join us if you want. No, and uh, if you go back in history, if you think of Club of Rome and movements yeah. like that, that has been done before. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, scientists are more active than sometimes it may appear. I come to a question of Annika Znav, and actually, oh, yeah. I had the very same question. And uh, she's asking, what in the short term is the most threatening tipping element in your views of the climate system? Well, I think Amy's suggestion is um, is a good, a possible candidate. The, the abrupt thawing and collapse of parts of the permafrost that's starting to unfold and the associated carbon release some of it is methane quite a lot of it tends to be co2 as well but there's enough of it that could be vulnerable to abrupt release to total of the order 100 billion tons of co2 that won't outweigh our total emissions but my word it's a, a significant addition to them and it would certainly amplify warming and it would sort of eliminate the chance of meeting the one and a half degrees c target so in that sense definitely that's a serious concern I, I it's a great question i i i also i don't think it's as likely but um i think any any credible risk to major monsoon systems west africa or india would be obviously a huge source of concern i think the issue with the ice sheets that i highlighted is often seen as a risk that is sort of going to unfold slowly, but it means that rates of sea level rise are already accelerating and they could accelerate markedly, especially later this century. That's a profound risk already if you're in Bangladesh and it's only going to get more of a widespread risk. And those are very vulnerable people in Bangladesh uh, subjected to, to, to the flooding and salt intrusion and so on. So that's not trivial um beyond that i didn't talk about it at all but the thing that i'm worried about from the north american heat wave in june july in particular is it's hard to rationalize that event um, as just moving the distribution of known variability steadily upwards in temperature or whatever that event is so far off the scale that you could interpret it as a sampling of a new kind of weather regime one that some models some of the CMIP-6 models suggest might exist. Uh, if it is, we would call it like a flickering event to a new weather regime, but I hope not because uh, it didn't look like a good weather regime to be entering, right? We might be one where you suddenly have these really fa uh, fatal, um, yeah, fatal extremes. So yeah, I won't say more, but um, I'll keep thinking about your question later. <laughs> Thanks very much. I have three raised hands and let's go to those really quickly. Um, even though I think you answered William's question that he put earlier before. William, your, your hand still raised. Do you still have a question? Hello. Yes, I have another question. Um, uh, whenever I attend a climate talk, I'm always asking myself, are we doomed? Are we doomed? Are we doomed? <laughs> Yeah. And uh, what I liked about your talk is you had so many, uh, you know, positive um, yeah. possibilities, which I really appreciated. And I like the story about AHA uh -huh as well. That was great. Um, so my question is, um, you m talked about there are regions in the world that are becoming more stable. We're moving away from tipping points in those particular places in the world. Can we learn specifics from those regions that will help us? Um, extend that to say other regions, I think you've given some examples already, mm. that will help mitigate uh, the effects of climate change. I hope so, William. Yeah, exactly. So I'm thinking if we develop this, what I call resilient sensing capability, and we spot, yeah, you know, ro robust cases where we do actually see 
resilience is improving even in some places and maybe we're able to detect that deliberate activities to to i don't know to regenerate forests or whatever it is are actually having the desired effects and making a part of the world more resilient then for sure we also want to have the sort of use of information technology etc to share that knowledge and do what you described which is you share the learning that okay we tried this here and actually it worked and it's um, and do you want to try it over there and that's my sort of mental model of a better future is we learn by doing innovating our way to improve resilience against the kind of tipping point risks we may struggle to avoid otherwise as well as trying to learn something about the positive tipping points i talked about and share that knowledge so yeah that's my kind of systems thinking view of 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 how we use this yes how we use these complex systems thinking to to get ourselves in a better place resilient to the to the bad stuff we can't avoid but doing as much as we can to accelerate the change we should know that we need <laughs> yeah okay thank you. I, I have one more raised hand by mark sergeant of isi thanks tim for your talk i hope you can hear me I can, Mark. Yeah. So, yeah, my question is purely academic, given the direction of travel in which we find ourselves. But you you showed that self-reinforcing feedback between tipping points due to global warming on one of your slides, and just mm -hmm. just that. I was wondering. So, for those of you who who do research on uh, tipping points, is the Earth system as a physical system more resilient to global temperature increase or to temperature decrease so if you <laughs> in a scenario where you go the other way and cool down would that lead to a, a quicker run away from where we'd like to be than with warming or how, how is the, the sort of the relative relative, relative benefit detriment impact well, there interesting question i mean what we've learned if we, what we think we've learned from the ice age cycles is the Earth's climate was anyway super sensitive to fairly modest variations in the Earth's orbit and the distribution of radiation across the planet. So it was turning a fairly weak orbital signal into a four degrees of global temperature change and 120 meters of sea level rise between an ice age and an interglacial. So in my view, the climate system wasn't that stable anyway before we started hitting it hard. Um, it was more unstable when you came out of an ice age. That would that's much more abrupt than going into one. So there's an asymmetry in the natural dynamics, and the asymmetry is on the side that sort of warming an ice sheet collapse seems to really go faster than the opposite growth. Plus, we know that the Earth's orbit's unusually circular at the moment. Unusually in the sense it's only every 400,000 years or so that the eccentricity of the orbit so how elliptical it is is minimized and we're, we're kind of going close to going around a circle around the sun that means that even if we weren't doing anything to the climate this would be an unusually long interglacial about another forty thousand years long so i at the moment it's quirky it's like the climate wouldn't be that sensitive to to x to cooling and plummeting into another ice age but for some of the reasons i've been highlighting there's certainly reason to think it's unstable when you push it warmer, perhaps more unstable in that direction. But yeah, great question. And to be frank with you, not a question that's addressed enough in, in the bigger picture climate science community, um, because after all, we haven't, we still failed to build three dimensional climate models that are state of the art, supposedly, that can actually capture some known past abrupt climate changes. So until we can do that, do we really want to, you know, how much do we trust the capacity of those models to capture future abrupt changes? I think there's good reason to think they're too, they're too stable uh, until they can be demonst demonstrated that they can capture what we know happened in the past. Mm. This would actually be a great uh, uh, subject to tackle in an EC workshop on uh, yeah. elements following up our forum earlier this year. I have, um, we have to come to a close, I'm afraid, and I won't be able to, but there is, uh, Laura Meyer asks a question about timing. Do you think that socioeconomic tipping points will be reached fast enough in order to prevent elements of the climate system, which are in risk of tipping in the next centuries from changing their state? I think 
I think they could be, but but that's up to us, Lara. It's not a hypothetical question. It's it's now a question of whether we all commit to and become part of um, decarbonising society and transforming our relationship with nature, in a sense, and food and land systems or not. And we can't just sit around expecting our elected political leaders to 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 purely drive that change. If it's going to happen fast enough, it's going to happen because of a mixture of scientists, society, finance, the media came together to make it ha happen faster. Because the whole second half of the talk was trying to show that we have some agency to do something about this. We are even at the simplest level, the consumers or not of the alternative technologies and the changes or not in behavior, it's, it's us. So we are, I'm going to hazard the guess that most of me and most of the audience on this talk are among the richer fraction of the world's population that massively overconsume resources, if we're honest with ourselves. So we're the ones who can, who can make a big difference, especially as in coalitions together, as to whether we make the transition or not. And that, that's, that's, that's how I am honest with myself about it. And I'm being honest with you about it. That's, that's the best answer I can give. We either join in and we make this thing happen or we don't and we face the consequences that I talked about in the first half of the talk. Yeah. Gio is asking if you can summarize the most important tipping points, but uh, I thought you've done such a great job in, in your slides. And I would like to recall that uh, your seminar, like the Game Changer uh, seminars are all recorded and will be put on the website. and. I can't remember which which slide the which the slide number was, but perhaps you 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 can recount where roughly it was where where you had this nice overview of the most important tipping points in your view. I wouldn't want you to to, to now have to recount them all. <laughs> yeah, I just hope. Yeah, I, I hope there was. I hope indeed that you it was in there. Mm -hmm. It, the, the talk either showed that uh, the answer to that or gave some clues about how to find the answer. If it's a question about the positive tipping points, I think I've hinted at some of them, but frankly, we're only now a few of us starting to solidly work on that. So I think there's a whole lot more waiting to be discovered. Thanks very much. I, I see a, I say a lot of compliments and- um, <laughs> yeah, Thank you, audience. And, and thank yous and um, uh, uh, Andrea Fisch has just, just been putting the link with the videos of all webinars uh, in the chat for those of you who want to revisit it, uh, please, please go there. Um, I would like on, on behalf of ISI really to thank you very, very much again, uh, Tim, for your time for this excellent talk. And I do know that by, we got you a little bit into trouble um, because uh, your, your, your date was actually blocked and you nevertheless made it free. So thanks for all your effort. And I truly hope that we can welcome you at ISI again and, and, and go for a workshop where we will try to tackle some of those questions that um, have been posed today. On a final note, uh, I would like to just mention that uh, next Thursday, the next Game Changer seminar will be entitled Forecasting Problem Geomagnetic Storms. Are stealth theMEs and I think uh, coronal mass ejections are meant here, a new space weather extreme uh, by Tamita Skov of LA's Aerospace Corporation. So I hope to see you all there again. And uh, again, many thanks to you, Tim, for the most exciting talk that you gave today. And I wish you all a nice evening and um, have a good one. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me, Michael and all.